I'm Brett Poulin. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Toxicology at the University of California, Davis. And my research group focuses on metal contaminants in the environment, and they could affect wildlife, or they could bioaccumulate and concentrate in fish, and they could also impact humans. And so we do studies across the U.S. looking at lakes and rivers and wetlands and try to understand how they're changing because of things like climate change, but also how we can improve them or remediate, remediate them. So the rivers in Alaska that are turning orange are due to uh, the thawing of permafrost soils. And so uh, the Arctic is warming four times faster than the globe as a whole. And we're seeing very dramatic changes in what used to be permanently thaw uh, frozen there is now thawing uh, in the summertime. And water is getting deeper into the soil and there are minerals that have these metals in them and they're undergoing a reaction with the water that releases acid and it releases metals and, and eventually that makes it into a river. And one of the metals is iron and it looks like rust when it, when it enters a river. And so that's why they, the, a lot of the rivers look orange. Yes, yeah, so we typically see this in a mining setting. And the, the term we use for it is called acid mine drainage. And that is because when we've mined certain types of metals, they typically are in a very specific mineral class. And when we open the, when we mine, we open uh, the earth up to the oxygen in the atmosphere and water for water to get in. And the combination of those two things uh, result in the same type of reaction where you get acid and you, you, you get metals. And it happens all across the US. So we're very familiar with the overall process. What was very unique about this study is that these are some of the most pristine parts of North America. They are in our national parks, these rivers. Uh, many of them we are have a congressional distinction. They're, they're termed wild and scenic rivers. And they're, and what's, and they're far from mining sources. And so it was very surprising to see this in such remote places that we often think is uh, you know, not going to be directly influenced by um, human processes. Uh, we, had, we were fortunate that we were monitoring one river where this happened. And we, we were collecting data um, for several years prior to it turning orange. And essentially what happened is all of the fish were gone from the river. We don't know if they ultimately died or if they just moved, but there were no more of the little critters, the benthic invertebrates. Those are like the little bugs in the stream that the fish feed on. They, those were completely absent. And the algae that are the base of the food web were reduced by over 50%. And so we, we were able to document in our first study a very clear shift in the aquatic health of the river due to this phenomenon. And when we've looked across now, we've been to many, many different sites, several dozen locations, we see essentially the same thing across the, these sites. We have some evidence that it can already impact them in the sense that it could change uh, their ability to, to partake in subsistence fishing. So if a given river, they used to fish in it, say for some of the species like um, it would be chum salmon, Arctic grayling, or Dolly Varden, if they are no longer there, we've, we've received reports from some of the tribal communities that they have had to shift where they're fishing if it's happening near them. Um, we're also looking at potential impacts on drinking water sources. And so many of the communities do rely on groundwater, which is generally going to be safer uh, from this, but we still want to test for that. And anyone that is in the back country is often you're relying on the river water. And so we've, the, the potential impacts could be some of the communities that are out beyond their community and, and you know, on the land. Um, but also recreationalists have contacted us wanting to know about how they can filter their water and whether it's safe for them to drink.
Yeah, we do see a strong seasonality and each year is a little bit different and that's made it a bit of a challenge to study because we we have to deploy finite resources to get to these very remote places and one might one location might be more active one year and then decrease and then maybe a new location may arise. Um, but we are seeing it's most active in the summer when the soil has thawed and water has gotten deeper into the soil. I, I always knew I wanted to study environmental science. I, I didn't know what I exactly wanted to do when I went into college, but I found that when I, I studied chemistry in my undergraduate degree, and it gave me the ability to really do really sound science in the environment. So I've always been doing work in the field, but using kind of these fundamental principles of chemistry to help improve the system. So I started doing work on wetland restoration in the San Francisco Bay as an undergraduate researcher. And I've been very fortunate. I, I do work in the Arctic, but I also do work in other systems like uh, the Florida Everglades, where there's restoration efforts ongoing and, and there's a threat of sea level rise. And so it's, it's really being in the field, but also being able to uh, better understand the contaminants that are cycling there and hope to uh, provide work that gives us information that, that we can't get any other way and also help guide management strategies or strategies to actually uh, decrease the effects of these contaminants. 